Dr. Powell, could you also tell us about your Staltram proposal for space launch propulsion? Vented superconducting maglev, 1966, first generation design, now operating in Japan, reached speeds of 370 miles an hour. And they're building a 300 mile route between Tokyo and Osaka, which will carry 100,000 passengers per day at a trip time of one hour over 300 miles. So it's a proven technology. So then 20 years later, I started thinking about, well, why couldn't we use things that the kind of system to launch things to space? So started looking at it and did a number of papers on it. And uh, the original idea was to run up a, a magnetically suspended tube up to about 20 miles where the atmospheric density was low enough. More recently, we've concentrated on launching it from a high altitude mountain and not with passengers because the deceleration forces would be too great, but just to launch cargo into space. And it looks very good. We launch 100,000 tons a year with one facility. It's 100 times what we launch now, and for one one hundredth the cost of uh, chemical rockets. So it, it's doable. Basic technology exists. It's just a matter of really engineering it. If and hopefully when StarTram is actually built successfully and functioning, mankind will have the ability to launch vehicles into space exponentially cheaper and faster. What sort of game changer would that be? Well, there's two game changers. One is that you launch enormous amounts of cargo up into orbit or trips like Dr. Diaz has mentioned to other planets and to the moon and set up colonies there. So that's one application. The second application is also very important. And that is to put up into geosynchronous orbit space solar power satellites that can beam down space solar power to Earth. And that's a tremendous opportunity. The benefits would be astronomical because we would finally be able to transition away from fossil fuels. People don't realize that every year we burn five cubic miles of fossil fuels. If you put them on Manhattan Island, which is 22 square miles in area, the one year supply would be the Empire State Building. And by 2035, it would be up to Mount Everest. So we got to transition from fossil fuels. And by putting solar panels up in space and beaming the power down with a low-cost launch system to bring the power down to Earth, the cost would be less than conventional power costs. And the solar panels in space can generate four times more power per panel than they can on the Earth. So it's tremendously environmentally attractive to do that. And NASA, as Dr. Diaz, I'm sure you know, has spent a lot of time looking at uh, beam solar power and thinks it's practical. A friend of mine, John Mankins, spent a lot of time and has written a book on it. The technology has already been demonstrated. They beam power from one Hawaiian island to another. I think it was about 100 miles or something like that. So we can do it. Just a question of getting the the heavy weight of the solar panels up there are cheap enough. You can't do it with chemical rockets. It's just too expensive. How many people or tons of payload would something like Staltram be able to launch a year? And what would be like the cost per person or ton of cargo for that? Well, as, as I say, if we're launching people from a high altitude mountain and it has to penetrate the upper atmosphere, the deceleration forces to aerodynamic drag forces are too harsh, uh, 6G or 7G for people. But for cargo, that's all right. And the cost to launch, it's about $100 a kilogram. So that includes the amortized cost of the facility and the cost of the spacecraft itself. So one facility in Alaska could launch 100,000 tons a year. 100,000 tons a year. Wow. Some common concerns about Staltram and how you can build a tunnel that long and keep it evacuated of air. How do you get the amount of energy you need to transmit to the ship down that tunnel? And how the ship handles that shock of exiting the vacuum into the air? Those are good questions. First of all, the tunnel is not evacuated. It's a regular tunnel, but it has an evacuated launch tube inside it. 
The best analogy I can think of is the CERN tunnel in Switzerland, the high energy accelerator is 27 kilometers in circumference, but the tunnel is not evacuated. Inside it is a meter diameter tunnel, evacuated launch tube. And the people travel along the tunnel, servicing it and so forth perfectly well. The CERN launch tube operates at one trillionth of an atmosphere with no difficulty at all. And in the US, we were about to build the superconducting super collider in Texas. It was going to be 87 kilometers in circumference. Congress decided they didn't want to spend the money, so they stopped it, but it had already started. So long tunnels are not a problem. My favorite tunnel is the Goddard Tunnel in Switzerland. They just completed a railway tunnel that's 50 kilometers long. And it, it works fine. It's almost as long as our Star Tram Tunnel, but it's bigger in diameter. It only costs 10 billion. So 10 billion is, is about what we're spending right now for a two mile across the Hudson River. Getting a little deeper into that, when you just hit that atmosphere, it's been compared to jumping off a bridge and hitting into water, a high velocity. And uh, they say they could destroy the rocket. Well, what we propose doing is around the exit, the tunnel would be sealed off until just before the launch and you open the shutter at the end of the tunnel, then there's a, what we call an MHD window. You're mentioning the hitting of the air. And what we propose doing is sort of standard engineering is what's called steam jet ejectors. You can position a series of steam jets around an entrance and push away the air, lowering its density to about one-tenth of what it is normally. So just as, as the rocket was being launched, you would have the steam jets create a sort of a partial vacuum around the entrance. But I'd like to point out that re-entry vehicles, the ones with nuclear warheads, don't have any problem coming down through the atmosphere. And they don't have higher densities. They survive. They're going at very high speeds. Yeah, they're going at almost orbital speed when they hit the atmosphere. Yeah, what kind of speeds would that be when they hit the atmosphere? When re-entry vehicles come in, it's about 7 to 8 kilometers per second. That's about 18,000 miles an hour. You say that there's just engineering problems in the way of building Star Tram. Does that mean that if the government or governments decide to fund it, that there would be no problems whatsoever in bringing Star Tram into fruition? I don't think so. Uh, we looked at one of the things you always worry about is uh, failure. If you launch something, it cracks open. You don't want it to fall on people. So we looked at sites that you would fly over the ocean, and Alaska down to Antarctica or some things like that. So that once you launch, there's nobody downwind. You launch in a remote area, so there's no sonic booms. So uh, from an acceptance point of view, I don't think there would be any problem if you, if you choose your launch site well. And I don't think there's any safety problems associated with that. The beauty of Starfam, in my mind, is that it's basically all the equipment is reusable except the craft you launch. And that's sort of a simple cylindrical structure, of basically a shell around the payload. How about your cost estimates for construction of Star Tram? About how much would we be looking for in terms of initial construction and annual maintenance and upkeep? Initial construction is about $30 billion, and that's based on existing tunneling costs, cost of the two materials that you use in various places like the superconductors. Star Tram is sort of unique in the sense that if you have a chemical rocket, you have one, two, or three, maybe or so engines on it. They all have to work perfectly, and they're very big and expensive. StarTram functions differently. It's using superconducting magnetic energy storage. It's a thousand modular units like it that have been constructed on a somewhat smaller scale. But you just have a loop of superconducting wire. You charge it over a long period of time. So you've got a thousand little engines and there would be no problem as far as generating that amount of electricity? No. Electric energy used in Star Tram is about $1 per kilogram below payload. Dr. Powell, your maglev 2.0, that sounds like it might make that problem not really 
big at all. Yeah, I, I think that's true. It could take 2G or a little less to accelerate to orbital speed, but then when you enter the atmosphere up at 20 miles, less than 1G deceleration through the remaining atmosphere. So it would be very low, yeah. And even older people go on roller coasters at 2G. Obviously, a lot of folks want to know, how would you keep it up that high above the mountain level? And, you know, of course, what would happen if it fell down? That's a good question. The whole thing is anchored with cables, both vertically and laterally. I looked at the wind forces, and from my analysis, the forces could be handled by cables. I don't, wouldn't be certain of that. That's a very major question. That's, that's one reason that we scaled back and concentrated on StarTram 1.0 just for cargo. And StarTram had that same option where you can lower it if there's a hurricane coming in. Yes, I think you could. Don't forget the Star Tram is kept levitated by magnetic force on a set of cables that support it. Magnetic force between a set of cables on the launch tube running up vertically and also a set of superconducting cables on the ground. And to lower it, you would just reduce the current in the cables on the ground, just lower it down gradually. So it could be done. I keep thinking, why are we explorers? What motivates us? George Lee Mallory, who died trying to conquest Everest nearly a century ago, and he was asked why he wanted to climb it, because it was there. And I understand that. I think that's a marvelous way to look at things. And the other one is when Sir Ernest Shackleton was pulling together his expedition to be the first to cross Antarctica early 1900s. He sent out an advertisement in the London newspaper saying who would want to go on his expedition and he couldn't promise anything except danger, possible death, and extreme discomfort. And he had 18,000 volunteers. So people want to do marvelous things. 